and be glad in it. Thank you, Roger. You got us off to a good start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome on this Christmas, New Year weekend. Uh, and our, our strange time, strange place. <laughs> 364 days till we do it all again. You're right. Um, so. I welcome you all on behalf of the Wilmington United Methodist Church. If this is your first time with us, and I have my glasses on so I can't tell. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to the inside of your bulletin. There are a whole bunch of announcements. One I was asked to be sure to announce is that our stewardship drive is going on, so please get your pledges in as soon as possible. Today, today, today would be lovely if you don't have a pledge card these fun little presents that are in the pew pockets. You could just take one of those, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate, and the rest will be taken care of from there. Uh, there's a whole lot going on in the life of our church. Next week especially, we have a very, very busy week. I understand that, and between the services, there is going to be a special party based on the results of our uh, survey and um, that will happen during the coffee hour time. So if you have gotten the survey by email or paper, please fill it out and get it processed because that will help us determine what direction to go as we proceed into the next phase of our Futures Committee program. Um, next week also is, like I said, a very busy day. After the 11 o'clock service, directly after, I'm going to feed you lunch. So if you like food, come, because this is the only time, really, with the 30-hour famine that we feed you. We have, <laughs> not, that's not, not entirely true. We do have food during the famine. But I need some administrative help with planning this year's famine. So if you are good at making phone calls or at organizing things on a computer or shuffling paperwork or even really good with a stapler, I could use your help. So please come next Sunday, right after the 11 o'clock service. I'll give you lunch and we'll get some stuff organized and planned for our 30 hour famine so that will run smoothly. Uh, with my commitments uh, through this next, however long it goes on with my school, um, my time is very, very well scheduled. So I do need some assistance with some of these administrative tasks, if you're able to do that. Next week also, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so you come in the morning and you have coffee hour party, then you stay for lunch and learn how to use the stapler to help the 30-hour famine, and then at 4 o'clock, we're going to go up to Crockmill Farm in Tewksbury for a fellowship event. This is for everyone. So if you like people or horses or hay, it's for you. So we're going to go on a sleigh ride if we have snow. And if we don't have snow, it will be a hay ride. So please come at 4 o'clock at Crockmill Farm. Another announcement to be, really be uh, focusing on uh, is our pasta dinner coming up on the 26th. That will help benefit our outreach committee and the work that they do. And last but not least, today, our coffee hour will be a baby shower for Jesus, which how fun is that? We're collecting baby blankets to take up to Lowell Wish, and we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus with a baby shower for him. So uh, there will be some baby shower games and some goodies and snacks and all kinds of fun down in Fellowship Hall, and that is for everyone. The Sunday school will be taking care of decorating and getting ready for that. Uh, are there any other, other announcements? Very good. 
So let us join in a spirit of fellowship and worship and join in our call to worship. born to a mother, Christ was born for you. For every per person born, breathe today as if it were your first breath. Every person born has life in Christ. For everyone born to kindred and friendship, every person born is in relationship with others. For every person born to challenge and questions, every person born will find a way different than another. All people born to this life celebrate our creation, appreciate our connection, welcome our inspiration in the Son of God who traveled this road with us and for us. Uh, remain standing for our hymn, I Love to Tell the Story, on page 156 of your red hymnal or on the screens.
join me in the opening prayer. Light of life, you came in flesh, born into human pain and joy, and gave us power to be your children. Grant us faith, O Christ, to see your presence among us, so that all of creation may sing new songs of gladness and walk in the way of peace. Amen. How are you? How are you? Well, this will be nice and nice and comforting, nice and close, nice and cozy. How you doing? Did anything interesting happen this week? Hmm? What happened this week? Christmas happened. So tell me what is special about Christmas. What's special? Jesus. Let's see, what did Jesus do on Christmas? Did he play hopscotch? No. What did Jesus do on Christmas? It was his birthday. I love birthdays. Do you like birthdays? I love birthdays. Do you like birthdays? I like birthdays so much. You know, I like them so much, I think everyone should have one. Is that a good idea? Yeah, got to think about that for a minute. I had to think about that. Yes, I like Christmas because it's Jesus' birthday. And the thing that's special about Jesus' birthday is that it got a whole new special thing going on with God on this planet. You ever think about that? That because Jesus was born, it meant that God sent his presence in the form of Jesus to be here with us. Is that cool? That's very cool. So Jesus was born a little baby and had his first night in a manger. And then what do you suppose happened? What happened? He grew up. He got to be a kid. Is that kind of neat? You ever think about that? Jesus was a kid. So what do you do as a kid? What does a kid do? Um, let's see. Yes? What do you do as a kid? What do you do? Do you do fun stuff? What do you do for fun? Tell me. You chew gum, play board games, and play catch. Do you suppose, and go to school, do you suppose Jesus chewed gum, played board games, and played catch? No, maybe the catch. Maybe they were able to fit together some kind, of, some kind of fleecy thing or something. Maybe he played catch. I doubt he played board games, but he probably play, played games with sticks and rocks. Sticks and rocks are fun. Now, do you think that maybe, well, and you said school? Jesus went to a special school at, at his temple. But do, what else do you think Jesus might have done as a kid? What? Saved lives? It's hard to say. We don't have any evidence of that. But one thing I do know that Jesus did, and he went away with his family. Who has ever gone away with your family? Yep. Have you gone a far way away from home with your family? And what happens when you go far way away from home with your family? Like in a crowded place. Have you ever been to a crowded place? What do you have to do when you're in a crowded place? What do you have to do? Stay with, your mom and dad. Stay with your mom and dad. That is a very, very, very important thing. Have you ever stay with your mom and dad? You know what happened to Jesus when he went to a very, very, very crowded place far away from home as a kid? He got separated from his mom and dad. A little scary? You think? Think it was scary for mom and dad? I think it was especially scary for mom and dad. Jesus got separated from his mom and dad, and he stayed at the temple, which was his church. And he stayed there, and he was having such a good time talking with their pastor, Kim, that he stayed there for three days. Want to hang out for a few days? I'll take that as a no. Okay. He 
did that, and he stayed there for three days until they came back looking for him. How do you think mom and dad felt about that? What do you think? Not good. What? Oh, angry and relieved, probably a little like that. Probably very nervous and scared, but they were very relieved when they found him. And you know what Jesus said when they found him? Why were you nervous? I was here all along. Why didn't you think I'd be here in God's house? That's a fun, funny thing to say, huh? Because they were probably imagining all kinds of crazy things. But the good thing is that Jesus, because of that, we learned that he was a regular kid just like us, but just, just like I am. I'm a regular kid. You think I'm a regular kid? I'm a regular kid. And he was also so connected to God that he knew to stay there and just be in conversation with people about God and all the lessons that they had to teach him. That's a pretty interesting thing, huh? Yeah. So, if you go far away from home in a very crowded place, stick close with mom and dad because we don't want them nervous or upset. But also remember that just like Jesus, as a regular kid, God is always with you and will always protect you and always take care of you. And that's an awesome thing to remember, right? Okay, let's say a little prayer. And then you're going to do something super special. Um, you're going to go for downstairs to Fellowship Hall and have a baby shower for Jesus. All kinds of fun stuff. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus' birth. And we thank you that Jesus was a kid just like us. And we mostly thank you that you gave us Jesus to show us your love. In his wonderful name, amen. Amen. So you're going to go with Mr. Bill that way down to Fellowship Hall, and you're going to get ready for a party. Yay. And everyone else, please stand and greet your neighbor in the love and peace of Christ.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 41 through 52, and can be found in your pew Bible on page 56, if you'd like to follow along. If I can find, okay. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it's okay, parents. You can cut yourself a little slack. Mary and Joseph lost track of Jesus, so it's okay, whatever we do. <laughs> there was one particular August afternoon. It was toward the end of August, and it was drop-off time at Girl Scout camp. The kids were supposed to go set up their tents and change for an evening of campfire activities with their required bug spray, sweatshirt, and long pants just to avoid being the dinner for mosquitoes. It didn't work out exactly as planned. All summer running around in shorts and bathing suits and a poorly executed packing list meant that the jeans that were in the duffel bag were at least two sizes too small and that quick rush to pull the jeans on over the pair of shorts looked more like something resembling a strange pogo stick activity. Not well done. No one should be surprised that kids grow over the summertime. It's not a shocker at all. After what seems to have been only a few days here or there, when kids are out of our sight, they seem to come back into our presence and be at least five inches taller. And for some of our kids that I saw the other night on Christmas Eve, those teenagers were now all of a sudden adults with children of their own. It happens. We may not notice it while it's going on, but it happens. And sometimes we even notice that even though they're growing in stature and height, their character has grown as well. All of a sudden, these teenagers, these kids, are the people that we hoped they would be. They have grown in the, into the people that we raised them to be. That makes us glad. Actually, a huge sigh of relief, if I'm being honest. The emotional and spiritual growth that our kids and, and others have gone through, every once in a while, we'll see a unsolicited example of compassion or empathy, or a vocalized realization that the world is actually larger than themselves. And there's pride in that. After all, it's what we're supposed to be doing as parents and teachers, 
helping them achieve responsible adulthood. So why are we surprised when our kids do turn out the way we raise them to be? We should never be surprised. We give them the tools and support, or we, at least we hope we do. We encourage them to, to participate in church and other activities that will grow them compassionately to be kind and loving people. And we hope the love that we have for them has an impact on them, to make an impact on those around them. For Jesus, his attendance at that Passover festival in Jerusalem, it was not an option. Adherence to the laws and rituals of the time and, and now still, he would have been expected and required to be there. His family would be faithful and attend their local synagogue, but a doing the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, especially for Passover, was more than just a requirement. It was a demand. So teaching and learning that Jesus had been, what Jesus had been receiving was not only education for that one time of the year, he participated in more than just those special observances. He received a steady progression of learning. So when he stayed behind to be in the presence of the teachers in the temple, was it really amazing? The teachers were certainly amazed at his profound answers and the conversation they were enthroned, involved in. He was wise beyond his 12-year-old temperament. What would be surprising about that? A 12-year-old having deep theological conversation. His growth and knowledge were impacted by his home life, by his home faith life. That is why it was so important for us, for our kids, and all of us adults, for that matter, to continue learning. If we continue in our knowledge and participation in faith, what does that mean for Jesus and for us? So does staying in touch with Jesus, staying, so does Jesus staying behind in God's house really surprise us? If opportunities and lear of learning are limited for us, we are limiting our experience of God. When we ourselves stop nurturing our own faith, we are stunting our willingness to understand God. There is no other activity that we can take part in that if we cut ourselves off from it, as easily as developing our faith relationship, our relationship to God and his community. When one of our kids joins a sports team, they don't stop participating because they played that game once already. We don't stop driving just because we got our license and we don't stop reading because we did that once before. Participating in and practicing faith requires commitment. What was good for our faith yesterday may not quite be enough to sustain us tomorrow. It's like asking a kid, why are you growing? Stop growing or you'll need bigger shoes. Why rely on a faith of a five-year-old that does not fit someone that's 35? When the foundation of what we have had has not grown into our adulthood, into our ever-growing experiences of life, we become ill-equipped to deal effectively with the challenges that life can bring. 
Jesus growing in desire for interaction and conversation was matched with his growth in his life. When participation and presence in building our faith is limited and made optional, the support that it can provide is weakened. If we do not continue to build that structural foundation of faith, the foundation will not be sufficient for the life and stresses that we continue to put on it. When Jesus traveled to the temple as the tradition was, we must envision that that was as full of the full extent of a big family excursion. It would not have been his first time to go to Jerusalem for Passover observances. In fact, the law was at that time, if you were within 20 miles, you were expected to be there every year. There's a certain comfort in that knowledge that you will be again next year in this place at this time participating in this worship and these rituals and habits. He would have known the routine and his family would have traveled in a very large caravan of people to and from Jerusalem. Through this practice, Jesus grew character. This episode tells us while he was still growing, he was still young, he had an extreme desire to learn and exchange ideas. This is why it's puzzling that Mary and Joseph would be surprised that he was still in the temple. The emotional and spiritual growth happens when we participate in regular worship and fellowship opportunities. The reality is that the relationships created and the bonds made with people sharing these experiences is truly valuable. If you were to ask any of the youth, and I mean any of them that have attended any of our worship, uh, mission trips, I am sure that they would agree that the journey, the car ride, was as valuable to them as the mission itself. The friendships and the bonds made through these experiences were essential to the overall experience. The shared involvement and the stories created from those experiences are what is part of the foundational support system that upholds them, that they cling to when times get rough. It is the stories that are created from the events that God uses to make his kingdom here on earth. It is the stories that come from our experiences that make our faith strong. Like today's scripture said, and if the journey to Jerusalem and back was uneventful, would it have had any meaning? Are there any normal stories of Jesus' youth? Or his entire ministry, for that matter? Or his entire life? The normal stories of our lives, the normal stories of his lives, don't make it into the Bible. So, that's what we must work toward. To create our story. The story of this church the story of our own individual faith. What is it that we go back to and retell and to share again and again about who we are and what is important to us? What is it that we tell to explain who Jesus is to us? What is our story of love and compassion? Is our relationship with Christ at the manger? Or is it at the cross? Or perhaps even the empty tomb? How does the story of a 12-year-old Jesus meet our own adolescent ideas of Christ? And how do we make Jesus known to others? 
Have you seen any opportunities to grow your faith happen recently? And are you willing to stay behind and encounter Christ in a different way? When Jesus stayed behind, he was not deliberately disobeying his parents. But he was leaning into learning and leaning into the knowledge of God and leaning into being a participant in what his faith story was. He was growing from the manger to the cross. Jesus was not disobedient, just learning and growing. He returned with his parents, but it was there in the reality of Jesus' identity that must have abruptly awoken in Mary and Joseph alike. The declaration of Jesus that I was in my father's house. In that Jesus claims his identity as God's child, God's begotten. The one that Mary had given birth to and Joseph protected. Our place in this story is right here and right now. Here we find the characteristics of Christ that were once told about and might not fit because we haven't made sure that we have packed the right size Jesus for our trip. A child's of image and understanding of God as maker of rainbows and Jesus in a manger, those may not be the experiences of Christ we need to sustain us in our daily lives. Are we staying in the temple with him? Are we having those conversations and listening to others in wisdom that they can only provide? When we limit our exposure to Christ, when we make participation and practice in our faith a default, if there is nothing else to do, we are not maintaining our faith base that will be able to sustain us when rains come. For us to understand that this is the place in the life of Jesus that we can lean into. Where we can find and understand who he is becoming through his youth. To share in conversations and experiences that are outside the normalcy of his regular life is to recognize the place that he has impacted others. Then his identity may have come into focus. The structure of our faith is a not a one-size-fits-all. Yes, we have one God, one Christ, one Savior, and one Spirit that lives within us. But we are to be active participants within our own faith story. When we give in to the places and experiences, when we grow our foundation in faith, that foundation will support us in the days to come. Amen. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Nurturing God, remembering the exile of the Holy Family and Herod's slaughter of the children, remember all those who need our sustaining love. Hear our prayers for the church and the community and in the world. We lift up to you, dear Lord, the names and people that we have raised here this morning aloud. We also ask you to enter our hearts and hear the words and names of those that we did not speak. Grant all these people and places and situations your grace, your mercy, your healing. In places in the world that are disturbed by violence and pain, by governmental issues, by places and, and people that choose to be angry or choose to be discourteous or choose to be disruptive. We ask your grace. And Lord, most of all, during this time of, 
of gladness and celebration. We ask that you touch the hearts of those who are struggling, for those who have experienced loss and for those who just need to know that your love exists for them. Grant that all people may hear together the song of your joy and find their homes in the garden of your justice and hope, that we may experience the fullness of life, which is your will for all of us. In the coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray together those words that Jesus spoke. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to be a one community of God and one family of faith, we celebrate this time of the year in many places in the Methodist tradition with a service called Watch Night. Watch Night is a service of celebration and reflection. It renews the commitment to not only the practices of the Methodist style of worship, but to the real, real, real renewing, <laughs> renewing of commitment to the profound love of God and this place that we have in it. As millions of Methodists around the world will again join in agreement and practices of our faith, let us together recite the contemporary version of the traditional Wesley Covenant. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to do what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. This covenant is a practice of the West, in Wesleyan traditions. And in our United Methodist Church, it is generally said on New Year's. So during this time that we consider these words we have spoken, consider them a trusted pact between not only us as Methodists, but those who are in the Methodist community throughout the world. Amen. Let us continue to celebrate our connection with our loving God through the celebration of giving of our tithes and offerings.
Let us all pray together. Loving God, you have given us joys and excitement of this season of hope, love, joy, peace, and love. For those gifts and the blessings, all their forms, please accept these offerings returned to you to be mixed up, pressed down, and overflowed to be a continued blessing for your people in your glory. Amen. Let us continue to stand and sing our hymn for everyone born.
if you purchased a poinsettia, um, please take it with you today uh, as that we would like to have them go out and not be sitting in here all week. So uh, please take them if you had one that you purchased. So as we leave this place, go with the knowledge that, yes? Thank you. Coffee hours in Fellowship Hall, it's a baby shower for Jesus. Let's go from this place with the knowledge that God sent a baby who became a child that desired to learn and to grow in his faith. So take that child with you and go in peace. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.